Module 13.1. As a reminder, it's recommended to print the video script and annotate the script while watching the video for later use. Video scripts are available on Canvas. Module 13.1. How can we test a claim about a parameter? Previously, we looked at estimation of a parameter. In this module, we will look at testing. Definition. A hypothesis test uses data from a sample to assess a claim about a population. You can think of the test as asking a question about the parameter, and we use the statistic to help us answer the question. Hypothesis tests have their own language. In this module, we will look at how to ask and answer questions about a parameter using the language of a hypothesis test. The structure of a hypothesis test is very similar to the structure of a criminal trial. We will first briefly summarize the aspects of a criminal trial so that when discussing the structure of a hypothesis test, we can compare it to something more familiar. Structure of a criminal trial. A criminal trial begins by a defendant being accused of a crime. There are two and only two possibilities. The defendant did not commit the crime. The defendant committed the crime. At the start of the trial, the defendant is assumed to be innocent. The prosecutor believes that the defendant is guilty, and it is the prosecutor's job to present enough evidence to the jury to prove the defendant is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Since the defendant is assumed to be innocent, the defendant is not required to provide any evidence of, ev of innocence. The defendant is put on trial, and the evidence is presented during the trial. Based on the evidence presented, the jury determines if the evidence goes against the assumption of innocence and supports the prosecutor's claim of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If the jury concludes the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, the assumption of innocence is rejected and the defendant is de declared guilty. If the jury concludes the defendant is not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, the assumption of innocence is not rejected and the defendant is declared not guilty. It's important to note here, the jury never concludes that the defendant is innocent. There is always the possibility that the jury made a mistake. The jury makes the wrong conclusion if it finds an innocent defendant guilty, and the jury makes the wrong conclusion if it finds a guilty defendant not guilty. We can think of a hypothesis test as placing a parameter on trial. In what follows, we will look at the structure of a hypothesis test and relate it back to the structure of a criminal trial. How do I ask a question about the population using the language of a hypothesis test? Recall in a criminal trial, a criminal trial begins with a defendant being accused of a crime. There are two and only two possibilities. At the start of the trial, the defendant is assumed to be innocent and the prosecutor believes the defendant is guilty, and it's the prosecutor's job to present enough evidence to the jury to prove the defendant is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Since the defendant is assumed to be innocent, the defendant is not required to provide any evidence of innocence. A hypothesis test begins with a researcher wanting to prove a claim about a parameter. This is done by identifying two competing hypotheses where one of them must be true. The null hypothesis is usually denoted by H subscript 0, and the alternative hypothesis is denoted by H subscript A, or you may see an H subscript 1. The alternative is also known as the research hypothesis. At the start of a hypothesis test, the null hypothesis is assumed to be true. The researcher believes the alternative is true and it's the researcher's job to collect data and present enough evidence to prove the alternative is beyond reasonable doubt. Since the null hypothesis is assumed to be true, we do not look for evidence in support of the null hypothesis. Helpful hints. We usually identify the alternative hypothesis first. The alternative is what we want to know about the population or parameter. The alternative is the research question. This is why it is known as the research hypothesis. How do we set up the null and alternative hypothesis for a difference between proportions? Well, we're going to look at this example and we'll look at several other ones in separate note sets.
You want to start by determining what you would like to prove about the difference between proportions. Usually, you will be comparing the population proportions to one another. The inequality in the alternative hypothesis is determined by what type of comparison you would like to make. A difference in population proportions is denoted by P1 minus P2, where the 1 and 2 distinguish the different groups. Other subscripts could be used. Under the null hypothesis, you will have P1 is equal to P2. You could also write P1 minus P2 is equal to 0. If you want to prove that the proportion from the first group is less than the other, you would have the following. Under the null hypothesis, you have the two population proportions equal to one another. And under the alternative, you'll have that P1 is less than P2. Alternatively, by subtracting P2 from each side, you could write the following. Under the null, the difference is equal to zero. And under the alternative, the difference is less than zero. Example. Is the proportion of males who support gun control less than the proportion of females who support gun control? We would like to prove that the proportion of males who support gun control is less than the proportion of females who support gun control. The symbol for the parameter is P subscript male minus P subscript females, where P males represents the proportion of males who support gun control, and P females represents the proportion of females who support gun control. The hypotheses are as follows. Notice, we're trying to prove that the proportion of males is less than the proportion of females. This is our research question. For this reason, in the alternative, we have P males less than P females. Under the null, we have P males is equal to P females. It's common to have the equal sign under the null hypothesis. You could have alternatively, under the null hypothesis, had P males greater than or equal to P females. Your turn. Take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can find the notation for is the proportion of males who support gun control more than the proportion of females who support gun control. Use the notation to set up the null and the alternative hypothesis. You should have the following hypotheses. Pause the video and see if you can set up the hypotheses for this question. Does the proportion of people who support gun control differ between males and females? You should have found the following hypotheses. How do I answer a question about the population using the language of a hypothesis test? Recall in a criminal trial, the defendant is put on trial and evidence is presented during the trial. Based on the evidence presented, the jury determines if the evidence goes against the assumption of innocence and supports the prosecutor's claim of guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If the jury concludes that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, the assumption of innocence is rejected and the defendant is declared guilty. If the jury concludes the defendant is not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, the assumption of innocence is not rejected and the defendant is declared not guilty. One important note here is the jury never concludes the defendant is innocent. In a hypothesis test, when the results as extremed as the observed sample statistic are unlikely to occur by random chance alone, assuming the null hypothesis is true, we say that the sample results are statistically significant. This is the same as saying based on the evidence provided by the statistic, if the evidence goes against the assumption of the null hypothesis and supports the alternative, then the results are statistically significant. If our sample is statistically significant, we have convincing evidence against the null in favor of the alternative. This outcome is known as rejecting the null, or we could say accepting the alternative. If our sample is not statistically significant, our test is inconclusive. The outcome is known as failing to reject the null. Statistical significance is a difficult concept, but also one of the most fundamental concepts in the course. An important thing to know about the formal conclusion is that fail to reject the null is not the same as accepting the null. This is because lack of evidence against the null is not the same as evidence for.
For the logical fallacy of believing that a hypothesis has been proved to be true merely because it is not con contradicted by the available facts has no more right to insinuate itself in statistical than in other kinds of scientific reasoning. And this is a fairly um, famous quote by a famous statistician suggesting that we should never accept the null hypothesis. Definition. The p-value is the chance of obtaining a sample statistic as extreme as or more extreme than the observed sample statistic if the null hypothesis is true. When the p-value is low, we reject HO. When the p-value is high, we fail to reject. If the p-value is small, then a statistic as extreme as that observed would be unlikely if the null hypothesis were true, providing statistically significant evidence against the null. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. Definition. The significance level alpha is the threshold below which the p-value is deemed small enough to reject the null. If the p-value is less than alpha, the results are statistically significant, and we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. If the p-value is not less than alpha, the results are not statistically significant, and our test is inconclusive. Often, alpha will be equal to 0.05 by default, unless otherwise specified. Many publications will use alpha equal to 0.05. The p-value can be calculated as the proportion of statistics in the sampling distribution, assuming the null is true, that are as extreme or more extreme than the observed sample statistic. If the p-value is small, then the statistic as extreme as the observed would be unlikely if the null were true, providing significant evidence against the null. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against the null in favor of the alternative. Comparing the observed statistic to the sampling distribution, assuming the null is true, requires the use of a computer. Instead of comparing the statistic to the sampling distribution, assuming the null is true, we will, use standard, we will standardize the statistic to create what is known as a test statistic, and we will compare the test statistic to either a standard normal distribution or a t-distribution to find the p-value. In later notes, we'll see that there are other distributions that can be used to find p-values as well. We find the p-value by finding the area under the curve that is at least as extreme as the calculated test statistic. Which tail of the distribution we need to find the area in will depend on the inequality and the alternative hypothesis. The image here illustrates the different types of tests for a single population proportion. There are three types of test. A p-value for a left tail test will be the area under the curve to the left of the test statistic. A left tail test will have the less than inequality in the alternative. The p-value for a right tail test will be the area under the curve to the right of the test statistic. A right tail test will have a greater than inequality in the alternative. The p-value for a two tail test will be twice the area under the curve to the right of the test statistic if the test statistic is positive, and twice the area under the curve to the left of the test statistic if it is negative. A two-tailed test will have the not equal to inequality in the alternative. The further a test statistic is away from the center of the distribution, the smaller the p-value. This holds true for normal distributions. For other distributions, it may not. The smaller the p-value, the greater the evidence against the null hypothesis. How do we conclude a hypothesis test for a difference between proportions? The conclusion of the test will be, be determined by the p-value and the significance level alpha. If alpha is not provided, we assume alpha is equal to 0.05. If the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null. If it's greater than or equal to alpha, we fail to reject the null. After deciding the correct conclusion, you will need to write the conclusion in context. Example. We are interested in answering the question, is the proportion of males who support gun control different than the proportion of females who support gun control? A random sample of 175 males and 150 females found that p hat males minus p hat females was equal to 0.12. In other words, there was about a 12% difference between the two.
Here, if we wanted to set up our hypotheses, under the null, we would say that the two population proportions are equal to one another, and under the alternative, we would say that they are not. Further, it goes on to say the test was performed at the 1% significance level, and the resulting p-value is 0.008. So what conclusions could we reach? Since the test was performed at the 1% significance level, we know that alpha is equal to 0.01. Further, the p-value here is 0.008. Since the p-value is less than alpha, and the correct conclusion is to reject the null hypothesis. We are able to say that the results are statistically significant, and our conclusion in context would be as follows. At the 1% significance level, we have enough evidence to conclude that the proportion of males who support gun control is different than the proportion of females who support gun control. Notice here we started out at the 1% significance level. Whenever reporting the results of a hypothesis test, we want to make sure we state what the significance level was. The reason for this is, is you can think of the significance level as saying what your allowable, er pardon me, allowable amount of error in the hypothesis test was. We can go on to further say the proportion of males who support gun control appears to be higher than the proportion of females who support gun control based on the information in the sample. Your turn. Read the next two following prompts in the script and see if you can write out what the conclusion in context should be. When you come back, we'll look at the answers together. For part A, you should have found at the 1% significance level, we do not have enough evidence to conclude the proportion of males who support gun control is different than the proportion of females who support gun control. The reason for this is, is our resulting p-value of 0.8 was higher than our alpha, which was equal to 0.01 in this case. For the second one, you should have found at the 10% significance level, we do have enough evidence to conclude the proportion of males who support, support gun control is different than the proportion of females who support gun control. And again, this is because our p-value of 0 0.008 for this example is smaller than the alpha, which is 0.1. When will you see hypothesis tests in the real world? Take a moment and read the article, School Delay Does Not Help Summer Born Study Shows. You've probably seen articles similar to this one in the past. Notice the article claims the researcher says the difference is not statistically significant. Let's apply what we know about hypothesis testing. First, notice that there are two groups of children. They are comparing pupils whose school starts was delayed and those whose school start was not delayed. It might be worth noting that it nearly sounds like they may have population data for the two years. Thus, we would have to act like these are representative samples from the population of all potential summer-born students who are delayed and all potential summer-born students who are not delayed. Based on the article, we know they found the following statistic. X-bar delay minus X-bar no delay was equal to 0 0.7, where X-bar delay denotes the average mark for pupils whose start was delayed, and X-bar no delay denotes the average mark for pupils whose start was not delayed. Since they were interested in learning whether delayed school entry for summer board children is beneficial, our hypothesis would be that under the null hypothesis, the two populations are equal to one another, and under the alternative, the delay mean population mean is larger than the no delay population mean. Since the results were not statistically significant, we know that they failed to reject the null, and we were unable to prove the average marks by students with delayed start was greater than the average marks for students without a delay start. One thing to note is that when the researchers say the difference is not statistically significant, they were referring to the difference in the sample means, which implies that we cannot conclude the population means differ. Do hypothesis tests always make the correct decision? There is always the possibility that the hypothesis test reached an incorrect conclusion. Before discussing the potential errors in a hypothesis test, we will revisit the concept of a criminal trial. There is always the possibility that the jury made a mistake. The jury makes the wrong conclusion 
if it finds an innocent defendant guilty, or the jury makes a wrong conclusion if it finds a guilty defendant is not guilty. There's always the possibility that a hypothesis test made a mistake. A hypothesis test makes the wrong decision if a null hypothesis is rejected. This is known as a type 1 error. The hypothesis test makes the wrong decision if it fails to reject a false null hypothesis. This is known as a type 2 error. Located in the video script are the formal definitions of a type 1 and type 2 error, and also the definition of what is known as power. The power of a hypothesis test is the probability that the null hypothesis will be rejected when it is indeed false. It is the opposite of a type 2 and is usually denoted as 1 minus beta. We can visualize the potential mistakes in a table. Along the top of the table, we have the two possibilities for where the parameter is located. The location is unknown to the researcher, but we know that the parameter must exist in either the null or the alternative hypothesis. Along the left side, we have the possible outcomes of the hypothesis test. For example, suppose that you are planning to run for student president. Prior to the election, you want to try to determine what percentage of the student body will vote for you. You know that as long as more than 50% of the votes are in your favor, you will win. For this example, we would have the following. Notice along the top, we have the two possibilities for the parameter, or what's actually going to happen. You either win or you do not win. Along the sides, we have the two possibilities of what could happen in the hypothesis test. You could fail to reject or reject. Ideally, if the null hypothesis is true, then we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if the null hypothesis is false, we will reject the null hypothesis. Again, looking at the table, these would be the two corresponding places of what would happen ideally. For the election example, we would have the following. Notice the hypothesis test concludes that there is not enough evidence to say you will win, and if the election were held today, you would lose, is signified by the box in the upper left. This is a case where the parameter is really in the null, and we fail to reject the null. The other case, which we would want to ideally happen, is if the parameter was in the alternative and we reject the null. In this case, the hypothesis test would conclude that there is evidence to say you will win, and if the election would held today, you would win. There are two potential mistakes that can be made. They are the type 1 and the type 2 error. Since the decision in a hypothesis test is based is reached based on the information in the statistic, there is always this potential for error. Looking at the table, notice that if the parameter is in the alternative and we fail to reject the null, this is a type 2 error, whereas if the parameter is in the null and we reject the null, this is what we call a type 1 error. In terms of our election example, a type 2 error would occur if the hypothesis test concludes that there is not enough evidence to say you will win, but if the election were held today, you would win. A type 1 error would occur if the hypothesis test concludes that there is evidence to say you will win, but if the election were held today, you would lose. Example, the pharmaceutical company is concerned that a drug may be causing people to lose their sense of smell. They perform an experiment in which 250 people are randomly selected to take the drug and 250 are randomly selected to take a placebo. They then calculate the proportion of people in each group who lose their sense of smell to see if they can prove the proportion in the drug group is higher than in the control group. The hypotheses are as follows. For this example, a type 1 error would occur if the conclusion of the test was that the proportion in the drug group is higher than that of the control group, when in fact the drug did not cause the patients to lose their sense of smell. The consequence here would be that the pharmaceutical company would have to unnecessarily pull the drug off the shelves. A type 2 error would occur if the test was unable to conclude that the proportion in the drug group is higher than in the control group, when in fact the drug did cause the patients to lose their sense of smell. The consequence here would be that the patients would be using the drug without knowing the risk and could potentially lose their sense of smell. Additionally, the company could be sued for causing people to lose their sense of smell. Notice for this example, the type 2 error is worse because the patients would be harmed and the company could face a lawsuit.
which is worse between a type 1 and a type 2 error, will depend on the specific scenario. This example did occur in real life, and a link with more information can be found in the video script. What is the probability of committing an error? The probability of making a type 1 error or rejecting a true null is the significance level. The consequences of the potential errors may motivate the choice of alpha before conducting a hypothesis test. Generally, by default, we use alpha equal to 0.05. If a type 1 error is much worse than a type 2, we may choose something smaller, like alpha equal to 0.01, whereas if the type 2 error is much worse than the type 1, we may choose something larger, like 0.1. Previously, we saw that as the sample size increases, the variability of the sample statistic decreases, and that the statistics tend to be closer to the parameter. As the sample size increases, there will be less spread in the kinds of statistics we see when the null is true by random chance. Therefore, a larger sample size makes it easier to find significant results when the alternative is true. In the case of very large samples, we need to be careful because we can detect very small differences that may not have practical meaning. Are the results of a hypothesis always of practical use? Definition. Practical significance is whether or, not finding, whether or not findings are of practical use. Notice this has nothing to do with the p-value or alpha. It's only if the results are of practical use. For example, a researcher is interested in the average BMI for smokers compared to non-smokers. They perform a hypothesis test to determine if on average smokers have a higher BMI. Let mu smoker denote the mean BMI of smokers and mu non-smoker denote the mean BMI of non-smokers. They perform the following hypothesis test at alpha equal 0.05. The p-value they obtained was 0.03. Since the p-value is less than alpha, we can say the results are statistically significant. Notice, if the mean BMI for smokers is 0.01 point higher compared to the non-smokers, do you think the results of that test are useful, i.e. practically significant? In this case, no, this is a tiny increase and not of practical use. On the other hand, if the mean BMI for smokers is 4 points higher compared to the non-smokers, do you think the results are useful, i.e. practically significant? In this case, yes, that is a large increase in 4 points of BMI has clinical meaning. What is the connection between confidence intervals and hypothesis test? In this section, we're going to look at the connection between the two. Recall that a confidence interval gives us a reasonable range of values for the parameter. If we know what the range is likely to cover the parameter, then we can use this range to tell us about the conclusion of a hypothesis test. If the null hypothesis value is located within the confidence interval, then it is a plausible value and the null hypothesis should not be rejected. Additionally, if the interval does not support the alternative, then we should fail to reject the null. If the null hypothesized value is not located within the confidence interval and the values support the alternative, then it is not a plausible value and the null should be rejected. For example, suppose we want to know how adults would respond to the question, does a child need both a father and a mother to grow up happily? Let P be the proportion of adults who would say yes. A 95% confidence interval for P can be given by 0 0.487 to 0 0.573. Suppose we would like to conduct a hypothesis test with the following hypotheses. Under the null, P will be equal to 0.5, and under the alternative, it's greater. And so the question being, should we reject or fail to reject the null? Notice in this case, we would fail to reject the null because 0.5 is within the interval. Suppose instead the interval ran from 0.122 to 0.234. Should we reject or fail to reject the null? Notice again we will fail to reject the null because all the plausible values are less than 0.5 and do not support the alternative. Suppose instead we had the interval 0.657 to 0.745. Should we reject or fail to reject? In this case, we will reject the null because all the plausible values are greater than 0.5 and support the alternative. When we determine the outcome of a hypothesis test based on a confidence interval, we do not compute a p-value, but we do need to discuss the significance level.
located in the notes are different ways to determine the significant level of a test which is determined by a confidence interval. If the hypothesis test and confidence intervals contain similar information, which one should you use? Confidence intervals are most useful when you want to estimate population parameters. This is often the case in ex exploratory or observational studies. Hypothesis tests and p-values are most useful when you want to ask a question about a population parameter. This is often the case in clinical trials, experiments, and confirmatory studies. Confidence intervals give you a range of plausible values. P-values quantify the strength of evidence against the null. Example, are the following questions best assessed using a confidence interval, a hypothesis test, or is statistical inference not relevant? A, do majority of adults riding a motorcycle wear a helmet? Notice here a hypothesis test would be best because we're asking if the parameter is larger than 0.5. On average, how much more do adults who play vid violent video games have nightmares than adults who do not play violent video games? Notice here we need a confidence interval because we're estimating the difference between the two. On average, were the 23 players on the 2010 Canadian Olympic hockey team older than the 23 players on the 2010 U.S. Olympic hockey team? In this case, neither are appropriate. We don't need sample data to estimate parameters. We could easily obtain this information and calculate their exact values. This concludes the module 13.1 notes.